Hello, great people. Pastor G is in the house. I mean, and I'm excited about it. I am very excited. Hope the day is wonderful for you. I'm just, I'm adjusting my phone as I'm speaking so that I won't be interrupted while I'm speaking. All right. I hope today is the day. Day has gotten off to the great start that it's supposed to get off for you. Now I'm having issues with my phone. All right. This is Monday. It's April the 9th. I'm excited about today. Uh, I had a couple of issues with my phone. Now, if my phone uh, shuts off for whatever reason and don't go all the way through, uh, it starts spinning or it says that I have been delayed, rest assured, I'm not going anywhere. I am right here. I've got some information for you, the blessed ones of God. Um, go ahead on and tell yourself right now. Go ahead on and make the declaration that I am blessed of God. I am highly favored of God. God is lighting my path. He's leading me into paths of success. He's giving me direction. He's given me insight. He's given me his revelation. And I will do great things in God. You know, sometimes you just got to make that a declaration over yourself. And you are the mouthpiece of God. Life, death, success, failure is in your mouth. That's the beginning of all things successful is your mouth. So you have to say the right things out of your mouth. So that you can see the right things in your life. You are the grace of God. Make no mistake about it. You are the grace of God. God created everything. He did everything in his plan just for you. And you have to see yourself on that level. You have to see yourself like that. Or what God is trying to present to you as he unfolds his plan for life, for your life. If you don't understand who you are in him, when he shows you the magnitude or how incredible the life he's designed and, 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 and wants you to live, you will renege on God. Yes, you will. And it's very important that you see yourself as God sees you. Because when you go about your achieving or your attaching or your agreeing with God for what he's already designed for your life, there are many people that you respect will say that it's not for you. And so you have to see yourself. You have to see yourself as God sees you so that when he speaks to you in your private chambers, he will, he will. That's what a, what is called a personal relationship. When you got a personal relationship, it is a picture of you uh, being able to converse with someone and the rest of the world is not privy to the conversation. And so when I have a personal relationship with God, that means that there's something that he's going to say to me in my personal time that he might not make privy to people that are closest to you. And that's okay. And they might sometimes feel some kind of way because they're not privy to the information that God has shared with you, his dear child. And and they might not get the definition of what personal means. Personal does not mean that it is announced to everyone initially. It's what me and my father are speaking in our private time together. And so this is why it's so important that you do carve out private time for him to speak and to guide and to lead because we're living in some confusing times and we need the direction of God. So you are the blessed of God. First of all, you have to understand I am the blessed of God. God does love me and he wants nothing but success for my life. And I like to get Lunchtime Uplift started off with us understanding who we are in God. You got to get this picture that you are what God said you were. And, and you were that from the inception or, or before. I, I, I speak about the before before. And you got a choice of befores. You can say before I entered into my mother's womb, God had plans for me. Or you can say before the foundations of the world that God had plans for me. And so it's kind of up to you to choose which before you want. Before you entered into your mother's womb or before the foundation. But first of all, I got to know that God has, ha, has a plan for my life. And that's an exceptional plan. God does not do anything halfway. He always goes all out. Yes, he does. And so when he, when he creates, he goes all out. And so you are an all out person. Now, once I understand that God has created great things for me, now I must have the instruction. You can get an incredible piece of, uh, God can bless you. I, I just, I just realized something. I got a new car and just yesterday I, uh, was, so we were, we were excited about the blessings of the new car and all the amenities and all of the features of the car. And I went out yesterday because it was so cold outside. I went out to the new car and started it up so that when my wife came out, she could come out into a car that was warm. 
I did not realize till later on that day that my my remote to my car would start my car and warm it up for me. Wow. So here's here's the thing. Here's the here's the lesson there. If I don't get all of the information, there are some things that are there for my advantage that I'll never be able to live out. If I don't have the right revelation, I can have all of these things at my disposal. I can have this incredible life that God has already carved for me to have. And if I don't get the proper revelation, the proper instruction, and apply the proper revelation and proper instruction, I can have all these advantages and never live any one of them. So now, I don't go out to start my car. I hit the remote because it came with the purchase or what was purchased. There's been some things that have been purchased for you. They are some incredible things that bring you an incredible advantage. Why would I have all of these things at my disposal and not follow the instruction to maximize every one, every, every one that has been given to me? It's already been bought and it's been paid for. And so that's what the life of Christ did for us. He bought and he paid for some things that we are not getting the full instruction. We are using part of it. Yeah, a, a vehicle is for transportation, yes. But it does a lot of other things as well. Yes, it will give instruction. You can listen to your radio in your vehicle. You can watch TV in your vehicle. So there's a lot of things that can happen. So we are very excited today about Lunchtime Uplift. If you will, please do me a favor. Go share this with at least 10 people. There's some instructions today. As you've noticed, the last few uh, uplifts, they have been uplifts, but they've been instructional. Why? Because when God has given you so much advantage, he also gives you the instructions to take advantage of the advantages. And we have lived far too long beneath the privileges of God that, that have been provided for us. And now is the time and the season that we maximize life. Life must be maximized. Why? Because God would not give you a life that he didn't want you to fully live. So let's live life to the fullest. So go share this with 10 people and tell them, come in the house, come Pastor Jesus, we're going to share some information that is very vital to uh, life success. And I do it humbly because it's not Pastor G in any of his wisdoms or his knowledge or his information or his smarts of any of that. But it's not by power. It's not by might. But it's about my spirit, says the Lord, as Zechariah 4, 6 states. So it's not about me being all of that. It's about the spirit of God that's all of that, using a vessel. And I yield myself as a vessel to speak. So tell somebody, get in the house, get in the house, get in the house. If you want to hear instruction, get in the house. Thank all you guys for being here. My friend, Apostle Anthony Bradford. Thank you, Vanita. Uh, for being in the house. Vanita Ross Franklin, thank you. Raina, thank you, Nathaniel Griffin. Thank you, Chris Bowens. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Terry Sanders. Thank you guys for so much for being in the house. Andrea, uh, home, Travis Taylor, thank you guys so much. Renee, thank you. Healing, Renee. Uh, uh, Chanel, thank you. Marcus, thank you guys so much. Pastor Darren Thomas, my sister Leah, uh, Stacey, Aaron Floyd, thank you so much. I always acknowledge people because people could be doing so many things and I never want to take it for granted. The God's masterpiece. Lakita Stout, thank you so much for being in the house. Now, I want to share something. It's been very instructional, and I believe God is doing this by intentions because there's a there's an idea that is out that uh, God is losing in this time and in this season. Well, he's about to show, uh, show up. And he's about to show out. Show up and show out. God never shows up if uh, without a show out. So get ready for you. Thank you, Kiara, for being in the house. Marlo, thank you. Never think that God is going to show up and not show out. He just needs somebody that's ready. and that. Uh, that thank you, Jonathan uh, and Sonia, for being in the house. He's just ready for somebody to avail themselves so he can show out through you. God is going to show out through you if you will allow. If you position yourself, get ready for him to manifest himself. That's the key. You got to position yourself for manifestation. Thank you, Mark Collier, for being here. Pastor D. John. Now, I want to I want to say something, and I'm going to go quickly today because there's a lot of information that I need to get into your hearing because to, today, I believe that new life begins today. New life begins today. And I hope your life has been a great life because if it's been great, it's going to get greater. And for those of you that life haven't been, all that you desire to be today is a turning point in your life. Get ready. Thank you, Nichols, for being in the house. Pastor Nick, thank you all so much. If life has been 
uh, somewhat of a disaster. Well, they claims and declare today that life changes for me. I'm getting in the instruction. I'm following the instructions of God. And he stands by every word that he says. He says, I can't. My word will not return to me void. I'm looking for the right vessel that yields themselves, and I'm going to show out. God needs to show out. We're in the show out season of life. Get ready to show out. Now, I want to read something because I want to show you the greatness. I've already went through all the things that you are. I want to share with you once again. I want to read into your hearing the things that God has given you. God has given you something. And I want you to be very clear about what it is. Make no mistake about it. What did God give me, Pastor G? Well, let's see. Psalms 115, the verse 16. Psalms 115. Thank you, Sylvester. Esau missed you yesterday. Psalms 115, verse 16. It says, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth hath he given to the sons or the children of men. Now, you, you hear that? The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth, this earth, he hath given to the sons and children of men. Now, now that is so incredible. So I have to see that this entire earth God has committed as a gift to me. And that's very powerful. God has given me the earth. That was his initial plan. That's what he's been recovering. That's what his desire to fully recover is this entire earth. And he's using you as his vessel to recover now now make no mistake about it i just got to talking about a car because the, we got what's called acceptable substitutions is a word that we're going to hear a lot about it's the the acceptable when god has so much your life was was built from day one when god constructed you when he gave you your parents your mother as the channel to bring you into this world he was bringing one of the most incredible beings ever into this earth realm he gave you a body. It's called the marker of mortality. He gave you a body to uh, achieve and do great things, to subdue this earth. Make no mistake about it. You are a person of dominion. And that's what your life should be, dominion. Your life should be dominion. Now, now listen, we will not fall for the acceptable substitution. We won't fall for a just a physical gift or a car. So many times we... Uh, we judge the blessing or we, we grade the blessing by a car or a house. That's just the tipping. That's just the beginning. That's just the, that's just the, that, that, that is, that is just the beginning. Thank you, Jeanette Wallace. That's just the beginning of things. So, so, so now cars are a blessing. Houses are a blessing. No doubt about it. They are. Uh, in the last three, six months, I bought three cars. But I'm not going to get it mixed up that that's the judgment for it. That's the thing. So many times the enemy gives us that. And so when we see a car or a house, we judge that as the blessing of God. And so we judge our relationship with God based off a car or a house. Now I'm living the kingdom life. Well, we won't settle for that in this season. They are part of kingdom life, but they're not the totality. God is trying to bring us into a mindset. That there's much more, there's much greater things. Uh, and when we take dominion over what he's given to uh, given to the righteous who think righteously in their mind, then it cuts down on the crime. Because he that 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 takes possession. Every every land when 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 God ever when whenever God wanted a, a, a cultural change in a place, he sent people there with the right mindset to change the culture. And that's what he's, that the big picture is, he's given you the mindset of heaven or kingdom mindset so that he can implant you in a place that the people in the place can have the kingdom mindset. Not just to buy a car to show people that you got a car, but there's a mentality that God is trying to interject. That's why he says, my kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I have to have a heavenly mindset. And that's what the issue has been. I had a mindset that if I got a vehicle, if I got a house, that that was kingdom living. And that's what you call an a, 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 a acceptable substitution. Because you anybody can get, if, if I judge my relationship with God based off a of material thing, anybody that's got six, seven jobs can go and get a car and say that they got the blessings of God. And now the mentality has not changed and you can get a hundred million dollar contract without a mentality change. And then where are we? 
We are back where we started. We are where we are now. So now, 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 Psalms 115, 16 is so powerful. God has given us the earth. Now, what does he say? He says, just like I told you about my car, about, uh, uh, I'm out there warming up that car in that 28 degrees yesterday until I found out that there was revelation or information that I had missed, the instructions I had missed. I was so excited about driving that I didn't know that the remote starts the car. And if I had not had a conversation on yesterday about that, I would still be out today, earlier, trying to start it to make it warm for my wife. And so here's what God is saying to us. There's so many things I've given you uh, as far as the earth is because I've given you total dominion. But now I want you not to just say I got it. Hear the instruction to maximize what I've given you. So therefore, if God is going to give you information to maximize, the enemy is going to plant tarots to alter the information so we can accept the acceptable substitution. But this season, it won't happen. Now, it is incumbent upon me. Let me say this. I'm digging in. Let me say that it is incumbent upon me. Upon me. Me, personally, I talked about a personal relationship with God. It is incumbent upon me to cultivate that relationship with God. God never makes me do it. He, he always suggests that I do. This is very important. Gifts and callings are without repentance. And so if I'm not careful, I can be ever so gifted. I can be ever be so on point on what my gift and call my singing, my musicianship, my prophesying, my speaking in tongues. I can base my relationship with God based off that and fool a lot of people. But gifts and callings are without repentance. So I can still have all that and the accuracy of the gifts. And then, as Paul says, and as the scripture says, I could be the one that lose everything. I could bless other people, but I myself be lost. And so now in this season, we got to make sure that even though we are gifted, even though we got all of these things, I have to make sure my relationship with God is cultivated. Listen, God does not make you do this. God wants us to come to him with a loving and willing heart. That's why he says, stand, Revelation 3.20, at your door and knock. If you open, then I come and I suck with you. I have time with you where I share my heart. But if not, then you're going to ride off your gift. And you're going to say, Lord, Lord, did I not prophesy? Did I not sing? Did I not play in your name? You can say, depart from me because we never had true relationship. I never knew you or know in scriptorial terms when Abraham knew Sarah, it meant that he intimately entered. He was not just acquainted with her. He intimately entered. So when he says, I know I never knew you, it meant that you never intimately entered and had relationship with me. You just use your gift. Now, this is so instructive right now because when God sends strong instructions, it's because he's ready for you to move into greater things. We have allowed the devil to use scripture to confuse our mind. Romans 8 says this, there's therefore no condemnation. And we, when people give us instruction, we think that they, you know, we got people saying, I'm not living, no negativity, no negativity, no negativity. So what the enemy has convinced us when people give us instruction from God, they're being negative because sometimes God will instruct us against what we want to do. It's called a blessing that I was about to do something incredibly wrong and he changed the direction. And if I'm not careful, when people come that say stuff for my good, I'm going to call it negativity and I'm going to go down a road of, 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 of things that's not working for me. I think the, the ultimate in my own definition of grace is God not allowing me to make that stupid decision. That's one of the greatest grace moments of my life is God preventing me from making a stupid decision because if it wasn't for his grace, I would make some stupid decisions and I call it a blessing because my flesh wants it to happen. Are y'all listening today? And so, and so, so we have to be very careful. That's what grace is about. God never shouts at you about what you better do. No, that's not God. What he does is emphasize what would be better for you. I'm going to say that one more time. God never shouts at you about what you better do. He always emphasizes what is better for you. So he stands at your door and not. So now watch when God gives instruction, we must understand uh, the spirit of God that is housed in your body will never agree with sin. Never. 
God does not change his mind about sin. So when Romans 8, 1 says there's therefore no condemnation, we must read the whole text because if not careful, we're going to redefine con con uh, a conviction and we're going to call it condemnation because the spirit of God convicted us not to go somewhere and somebody, he sent instructions to say don't go there. And then the first thing we say, you're trying to condemn me. No. The Bible says there is therefore no, well, I'm going to read it so I can show you what it says. Exactly. There, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. There's always a, a totality of scripture. We have pulled out the part that we want. Now you can't condemn me. You can't condemn me. Well, you're right. Nobody can condemn you. You're right. But if you're not following the instruction, you're already condemned. Watch it. There's therefore no condemnation, though, which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So in other words, you are condemned if you are not walking after the spirit. It's not anybody else trying to condemn you. You are defensive because the spirit of God is never going to agree with the sinful life. God never changed that. And so he says, you have a choice. If you walk in the spirit or follow the instruction, you won't be condemned. But if you don't, then you're going to be condemned. It's not people condemning you. It's the word that condemns. Because there is an order. Because when I'm opted of the word, then I'm already living in condemnation. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. It's in the book. It's there. It's there. So read the whole totality of the passage before I say you can't. We have redefined conviction and call it condemnation so when the word comes that convicts we say that's condemnation and so we say that's negativity and i'm not listening to no negativity and the enemy has got us twisted into a moment that we're calling condemnation when it's actually god saying i'm giving you instruction right now because i love you so much and so now he give us the earth and he says now follow the instructions and i'm gonna allow you to maximize the moment Oh, this is so powerful. This, this is why in Isaiah 1, I think it's the 19th verse, 119, it says, If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you be willing. Now, watch this. If you be willing and obedient, you're going to eat the good. What is he saying? If you be willing and obedient, what I have given you as a gift, you will be able to eat the good from the gift. It would be very depressing. It would be very annoying for me to have a new car and not find the keys to drive it. And it's just sitting there. I'm just saying, whoa, that's a beautiful vehicle. But I don't have the keys to get inside of it and, and take advantage of it. And so the Bible says that the earth has he given to the sons of men. The instructions are the keys to maximize what he has given. Oh, yeah, it's true. It's true. I'm reading scripture now. If you be willing and obedient, what shall you do? You shall eat uh, the good of the land. It's a, it's, a, it's a choice. Now, I know that the enemy has caused us to uh, lower our bar. And now we got some certain things and we call it the blessings of God. But can I show you something here? It's very powerful. Paul says this because he knew, he knew that God had promised and he knew that God wanted us to live in the promises. And so he says, he says, listen to this. I'm reading to your hearing once again, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. 7, 1. It says it like this. It says, having therefore these promises. What promises? God, the list of promises from God. There's a list. There's a list of promises. There's, there's some things that God said you should have. And he's promised them to you. Now, he says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat of the promises. This is so powerful. There's a, there's a doctrine that says, don't worry about it. You're going to eat it anyway. Now, you're going to eat of the land, but it says, if you be willing and obedient, you're going to eat the good of the land. Yes, that's what I want the good of the land. I, 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 want, I, I want the living before Adam uh, uh, disobeyed God. And now from the sweat of your brow, you shall uh, eat from the land. Because that's cursed in the ground. And now he ate from it, but it was the sweat. He had the labor. He had to, had to do things. But before the curse, uh, God sent things. That's what he's trying to return. Hard labor is after the curse of the ground. Are you still here? So if you be willing to be, you're going to eat the good of the land. Now, now let me emphasize what Paul says. Having these promises, 
Heavenly is from the dearly beloved. He didn't say outcasts or heathens. He said dearly beloved. Those that are believers, dearly beloved. Look at what he said. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. You hear that? Flesh, that's, that's, that's 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Just in case, that's New Testament, right? Because uh, there's so many that say Old Testament don't apply any longer. This is New Testament. This is after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here's Paul that had been given the grace to speak the great message in its fullness. He's saying to us, dearly beloved, who God has through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son given you some promises. He says, therefore, therefore, cleanse, your, cleanse yourself, not God cleanse. He says, you cleanse your flesh. Watch what it says. All filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God or in the respect of God. In other words, he's returning the respect to his body. I am sorry. Let me please apologize and let me apologize very quickly. Uh, uh, men of God, women of God, believers, Christians, whatever you, uh, uh, you're giving yourself title. It is incumbent upon us that we live the life of Christ when we are in public and in our private life. So we have to know it is very difficult for someone to believe you when you can turn it on and turn it off. This is this is where the issue is. When you can turn it on when you so desire and when you can turn it off when you so desire. It confuses people. This is why people are saying they're confused because we are sometimes the only God people see. My life is a reflection or supposed to be the reflection of God himself. So I can't turn on and turn off when I want to. I can't do it when it's convenient and then when it's not convenient. I can't turn it off. That's where the confusion is. It's just, it just is what it is. And so the acceptable substitute for the enemy said, yeah, you can do it whenever. And when I was, Paul said, when I was in Rome, I acted like the Romans. Come on now. Paul was not talking about a change in his lifestyle when he was with Rome. We got to, we got to be very careful because people are dependent and God also is watching what we say and what we do. So he says, let's get perfected holiness in the fear of of God. This is very powerful and we have got to see this because right now there's a shift. How will I get to that part? There's a shift. Now we got the precious promises. He says let us cleanse ourselves because I can have these advantages and never live them. Keep living. You know that God brings everything with instruction. He never says what you better do. He says this would be better for you if you follow this instruction so that you can maximize. And then he says also in in this same book, that if chastisement is not received by a child, then I deal with him as a bastard. And what does that mean? The 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 chastisement is an instruction. Chastisement, this passage definition. Chastisement is instructions that secure a successful end. When God comes in, He's giving you instruction that will secure your successful end. In other words, that's what predestination is all about. Two things are in predestination. There's the beginning before, the, and then there's the end destination. And so he gives you instruction that allow you to go from where he pre before your mother's womb, before the foundation. And then he says, I can guarantee you that if you follow the instruction, you will get to your destination. And so here's the instruction. He says, now follow this because I'm not going to make you go there. And there's not a guarantee that you're going to get there. Destiny is an option, not a guarantee. That's a tweetable tweet right there. Destiny is an option, not a guarantee. There's many people that with great destiny that are in the graveyard. It's the choices that I must make. Please read your scripture. Please read your scripture. Please read your scripture. Now, let's go to something. There's a choice I must make. The... Uh, Decisions decide seasons, in other words. Your decision that you make will decide seasons. Now, what's more powerful than that? Your decision that you make will determine your choices. That's another tweetable moment. Your decisions will determine your choices. If I have decided to be married, then it affects the choices that I make after I decide to be married. Now, the choices that I make in deciding to be married is different than the choices I would make if I decided to be a single man. 
I'm just trying to build an illustration. So your decision decides seasons, but your decision also will determine your choices that you make. So you must make a decision that I'm going to follow God, then it'll affect your choices that I make. This is very important that I understand this. God is not going to make that choice for me, but he will stand at the door and knock and say, if you open, I come in and instruct you, and then I give you success for him. Chastisement is the instruction of God that secures a successful end. What happens if I don't listen to his chastisement? He say he deals with me as a bastard. What does that mean? He deals with me as if I'm not his child. So, so what does that mean, Pastor G? That means that where he would instruct me about decisions I'm about to make, he no longer instructs me. He says, yes, go ahead and make the decision that you think is best for you. Now, that's nothing more uh, 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 disturbing than for me to make a decision that God has not given me instruction on. You know what? If you were like me, you would turn yourself inside out. If God did not destroy you. That's what I say. That's why I say grace is God not allowing me to do the next stupid thing that I think is so important for me to do. That's what grace is. It's stopping me from making stupid decisions. So here it is. He chastises me, give me instruction to secure my successful end. If, if, I, if I reject him, then he says, okay, I'll take my hand off. Make the best decisions for your life. You don't want that. I don't want that. I need God's instruction on every move I make every day of my life. This is lunchtime uplift. This is very uplift. I'm getting to something. I already told you what the gifts were. He's giving you the earth. He said, this is all yours. This is what I want you to live. I want you to have it. But I need you to be instructed on how to use it because everything you do must bring me glory. That's all he thinks he's saying is I want you to bring me glory in your life. And right now, I'm not getting as much glory as I'm supposed to have because... People are not making right decisions, in other words. Now, here's the decision. Uh, Psalms, let me go Psalms uh, 84. Psalms 84. Psalms 84. I want to read a couple of passages. I got to make a decision. My future has got to be so clear to me that it make me willingly want to let go of my path. Past. My future has got to be so bright and i gotta have such a clear revelation because when i see what god is planning in my future and i see it in the full revelation of god it'll make me throw everything out the door that's in my past that's why paul says it second corinthians there again six seventeen. right he says he says if any man be in christ he is a new if any ain't it interesting that we never emphasize the words if any man, not that everybody is, he says, if any man have made a decision to let him in, he's in Christ, old things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. That's only if I decide to let him come in and change me. If I let him come in and, 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 and redo my mind. If, then I'm a new creature. So until I let that happen, I can't really see the future with a spiritual mind. See, what God is doing is so spiritual that he, he encoded it like that because He need, the only way he allows me to see into my future is that I have a spiritual mind. That's why Corinthians says again, who knows the mind of a man except the spirit of man? The same thing with the Christ or God, what the spirit of God. So if I am not allowing him to invade my space and re redo my mind i can't see in fullness what he's doing in my future because it's spiritual because jesus says in, in luke 4 that the spirit of the lord is upon me he hath anointed me to do all this 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 and this and one of the most incredible things is to announce the acceptable year of love which is the year of jubilee this was not a calendar year this was a spiritual thing and so if I don't have the spirit of the Lord, then I can't even announce or declare anything that's in God because I don't have a picture of it. So if I don't have that in spirit, I will hold on to my past because my past will always look better than my future if I'm not living in spirit. Wow. And so, and so, and so here, it, here it is. He says you have to make a choice to see what I'm doing in your future and you won't be able to let go of your past. Because if your past is still everything to you, it's because you haven't got a clear glimpse of what I'm about to bring you into. And he says, I want to give you clear. So now watch this. There's a choice. Uh, Psalms 84. 
I want to read something there real quick, and I'm moving fast. Psalms 84, let's go with verse 10. I want to read this. For a day, here's the decision. So my future has got to be brighter than my past. Yeah, I got to let go of the old. Now watch this, very important. My future got to be brighter than my past. I've got to see it so brightly and, and in detail that I don't mind letting go. That the decision and the discipline that it takes to let go can only be made if I see it in clear vision. And so watch what watch what he watch what it says in Psalms uh eighty four ten. It says, For a day in thou courts is better than a thousand. A day in the courts of the Lord is better than a thousand good days in my past. Watch it, watch it. Oh. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of the wicked. In other words, here's the writer saying, when I see what God has planned, uh, just a day in favor is worth a lifetime of labor. When I see, I, I would be a, I would rather be a doorkeeper in destiny than to reign in my past. Just a doorkeeper in destiny and my purpose. Because that day there is much greater than a thousand days. Oh my goodness, this is so wonderful. The 11th verse, this is Psalms 84. Here's the 11th verse. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord will grace will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk upright. Do y'all see this? No good thing will he withhold from them that walk upright. So if the Bible says no good thing will he withhold from them that walk upright, that means that there's some good things that are being withheld from them that don't. Oh, this is powerful. Now watch this. The 12th verse says it like this. O Lord of hosts, blessed is the man that trusted in thee. Blessed is the man that that looks toward his future and say by faith i grab what you are promising me and letting go of that that is good to me because a day one day in your courts is better than a thousand i'd rather be a doorkeeper in destiny than to just live in life and and 11 verse says for god is a son and shield the lord will Give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk upright. Now, this is why the enemy is speaking messages that nothing matters. Because he knows that to walk in the, the, the totality of the, the blessings of God on the level of God, there's instructions that must be followed. It's no different from any great parent that tell your children, if you want the keys to my car, you must follow my instructions. If you want to live in my house, you must follow. This is why God gives uh, parables about earthly things that we can understand because he's trying parab parable there again. Para mean parallel. Bole means to cast alongside. I take an earthly message to cast a spiritual meaning alongside so you can grasp. So he gives, he says, do you have earthly fathers whom you honor? How much more am I? In other words, he says, I'm giving you an instruction. If you as an earthly father know how to, to govern your child's behavior and then give to them accordingly, how much more am I? I use the same concept, but as, as a matter of fact, I've written the concept, but I've given you a, a physical experience so you can understand what I'm saying in the spirit realm. So I have to make a choice. I have to see that what God is presenting to me and, and the disciplines that it takes to get there is much greater than what I'm living currently. And that's the decision that we're making. The enemy is placing so much uh, 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 illusions out there that we think that what he's presenting is much greater than God. Not so, my brothers and sisters. Whenever you get into the fullness and whenever we get into the fullness, not as though I have already apprehended, but I do seek after that thing that is, is trying to apprehend me. Amen. And we're all going there by grace. So can I move a little further in the instruction? Amen. Let's move a little further. Now, we must look very clearly at what God has designed for us and ask them for the and ask him diligently for for the instruction and then be disciplined enough that whatever he says to me is for my good. 
even though it might rearrange my life and shift my life, it might move certain people that I like out of my life, it might move me from certain situations that I thought I really loved and, and things that I thought I really needed. And he shifts our life because he said, if you get what I'm trying to give, you are going to live much better than you've ever lived before. Amen to that, somebody. If I can get what God is trying to give, I can live much, much better than I ever lived before. And that's the choice he's placed on the table. That's the decision that must be made in this season of your life. A decision decides season. And when I make the decision to walk into God's greatness for me, then my choices will be all God's choices. He will influence my choice when I let him be the Lord of my life. Now, let me emphasize something. Let me emphasize this. I'm breaking it all the way down. I got to break it all the way down. I don't want to leave one stone unturned because it's too urgent in this season that we're walking this. Not one stone unturned. It's one thing to know God as your personal Savior, and we all should. But it's altogether another thing to make Him Lord of your life. I'm going to say that again. It's one thing to make Him my personal Savior, and we all should. But it's altogether another decision to make Him Lord of my life. See, we can go to the altar on Sunday morning and receive him as our personal savior. Because he done that at Calvary. That wasn't a choice of yours. That was a choice of his. When we were dead, yet in our sin, he commended his love toward us. That was his decision. The position of being righteous is a God decision. Now, to make him Lord of my life where he can come in. What is a Lord? A Lord is one that can influence your decisions. A Lord is the one who can tell you where to go and where not to go. A Lord can tell, is the one that can tell you what to say and what not to say. Now, I can make him as my personal savior because I accepted him. But the other choice I got to make is to let him be the Lord of my life. Chew on that. Chew on that. Because that's going to determine the decisions that you make is him being Lord. And we all know that the Lord of your life will come in when you think everything, you got it all figured out. And he says, no. Let's go this direction. And if you're not, if he's not Lord of your life, you'll continue in the direction that you're going. Let's read something here because God wants me to have his best in totality. He does not want me to accept the acceptable substitution. He don't want me to live subpar. He don't want me to have just one blessing. His desire is that I have all of the blessings. Let me tell you what he done. And I'm going to paint a good picture. If you go to first, uh, Second Corinthians, the 8th chapter, the ninth verse, look at what it says. It says, for ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know this grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, already rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor, that through his poverty, you might become rich. Ain't that powerful? He was rich. The second in the Godhead is the son, always. Now he 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 for the grace and the love of me he became poor. He, or in other words, he became who I am so that I can become who he is. He everything he became who I was so that I could become who he is. That's what it what it's saying. Now now notice the passage of scripture says, and for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. Now do you understand what that is saying? For the joy that was set before him. He endured the cross, despising. Cursed is the man that dieth upon the cross. What is the text saying? Now, here's what I must emphasize. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Are you Listen, I just told you we know the grace that he was rich and he became poor. Now, what I must understand, the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He was already in position and very rich in his position. So I must question what was the joy that was set before him that made him come to the cross? Because the cross didn't provide anything for him. The cross provided everything for me. So it said for the joy that was set before him. So I must understand the joy that was set before him is that not only he be rich, but he positioned me to be rich. Now that's an incredible savior for him to say, I'm going to get joy and I'm going to have to take down and come down and become poor so that I won't leave you behind now notice what that means no child left behind so no child of god should be left behind so there's a choice i must make because he's standing at the door knocking and said make the choice to live like me i'm, I'm gonna give you an example that's why he spent three 
and a half years in ministry in his whole entire life so that he can give me an example of what I could do and how I could live it and the advantages of being in the flesh. So I would have no excuse. And he had to make a choice. Remember in the garden, and he makes it so clear in, in Luke uh, 22, 23, in the garden, he makes it very clear. It says, Father, if it be your will. In other words, I'm in the flesh. I, I think like these men because I'm a man in the flesh. And I see what I was uh, 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 sent here to do. But it's so difficult that if, if it be your will, can we find a different way to do this? And he left no stone in turn. Because he said that I know there will be days that it's going to be difficult for you to do what you know that you were sent to do. And it was the same with me. So don't 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 get it twisted that he don't understand where you are, that there's a difficult choice because the lifestyle that you just live is going to always pull at you when he's pulling you for higher. Ain't that great of our Savior to say I'm going to be a high priest that has been tempted in all shapes, forms, and fashions. That every time, I'm not condemning you, I'm just saying, I know what you're going through. It's difficult, but it's doable. And so now, let's let's go. Let's go because we can can make decisions that causes us to be cut short. And God wants us in this season to fully go after and fully obey his instruction. Fully. Fully come after. Fully obey. Because there's things uh, that he's given us. And he's given us a whole lot. God will never ask you for something that he has not already given. That's why the scripture says, much is given, much is required. And God knows what he's given you. And he never asked you for what he's not already provided. You went. So 2 Kings 10. I'm going to read something very powerful. 2 Kings 10. I'm talking about a king by the name of Jehu. Who walked in the ways of God. Semi. Semi. He, uh, I can hear him praying saying, God, you know, I did this and that. And God said, that's great. But I, I told you, this is, I want you to do this too. And so, so many times we think that because I do a couple of good things, God ought to be happy and say, but he knows what he's invested in me. He already knows what I've given you, the gifts I've given you, everything. So I already know what I, 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 I've given you. And so he says, I'm not going to ask you for what I didn't give you. I, I think so many times, a very powerful revelation. I think so many times of uh, how... Uh, God, when he allowed the children of Israel to leave bondage in, in Egypt. Very powerful story. You read this, uh, 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 Exodus 12. And uh, when he says, before you leave, go and borrow some things from your neighbor. I want you to get gold and all that. And it's just strange that he would tell them, you going into the wilderness. There ain't no stores in the wilderness. <laughs> ain't no, and, and people have come up with revelations and all that about he wanted them to feel or have a certain mindset when they got into the wilderness. Well, not. Well, okay, I guess I guess that could be applicable to the moment. But here's what is really incredible. Much is given, much is required. God never asks you for what you don't have in his gift to you. If he asks you for it, don't get it. So here it is. He's telling these people to go ask for this goal. And they go ask. And I'm wondering, why do I have all this goal? Well, they didn't know that God had a plan. What was the plan? That when you get in the wilderness, I'm going to build me a tabernacle. Something in a place for me to be worshipped. And I'm going to ask you to give to the building of the tabernacle. And if I'm going to ask you to build, give, to give the gold to build the tabernacle, I've got to give you the gold to, to give to build the tabernacle. So you don't know that when you're asking the Egyptians for the gold, I got a plan that I didn't even tell you about from the beginning. But I knew what the plan was. So I already told you to get the gold. God had never asked you for it. What he did not already give. Oh, that's a very powerful revelation. Maybe I'll teach that on another time. But if you don't get the instructions of the blessing, like they didn't have the instructions on the goal, God will give you the gift, but you must get the instructions of what this is all about. And that comes in prayer. He'll instruct you. But if you just take the gift and don't ever get instructions, what God gives you as a gift, then you will make it into an idol. That's why I got to get instructed. So I can get all the gifts and make all those gifts and idols and begin to worship my house, my car, if I don't get the instruction. God does not want my gift to become an idol to me, just like Israel did. In the wilderness, God had given them the gift. They didn't have the relationship. When Moses went up to the mountain, they took the gold that God had planned to make him a place of worship, and they made an idol out of it. Amen.
I am in 2 Kings, the 10th chapter, and I want to read this into your hearing because we got to fully obey God to the fullest. Somebody's hearing this, and today your life is about to explode. 2 Kings 10, did I say 10, 30? And the Lord said unto Jehu, Jehu now here's Jehu, Jehu he's went into the, the temples of Baal and tore every down, every idol. And God is loving that. Watch this, watch this. But I need you to follow this. It says, And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in mine eyes, watch it, and has done unto the house of Ahab, according to all that was in mine heart, thou children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. He's applauding Jehu for the good work he had done. Please listen. Here the 31st verse says this. And Jehu took no heed to walk in the law of the Lord God of Israel with all his heart. Please hear me. He took no heed to walk into all of the law. Now he done tore down some, some temples of Je uh, Baal. That was good. But he found not in his heart the desire to walk fully. Watch this fully fully in all the law of god of israel with all his heart for he departed not from the sins of jeroboam which had made israel to sin 32nd verse listen to this in detail 32 this is second kings 10 32 here's the 32nd verse in those days the lord began to cut israel short and Hazael smote them in all the coast of israel now let me unpack that real quick Jehu tore down some uh, uh, idol worship uh, places of Baal. God was applauding him. That was good. But he did not find it in his heart to completely obey the fullness of God's plan. And so what happened? God began to cut Israel short. Now, understand what that means to me and you. Understand what the scripture is saying. God applauded him and now he's living some good things. But now, since I did not fulfill the totality of what God had commanded and desired of me, now I am being cut short. What does that mean? I thought I was going to be able to maximize this, but it seems like things in life are coming up short. When I know I'm supposed to be the blessed of God, and I know that I'm supposed to be getting it, I know I'm supposed to be walking in this, but it seems like things are coming up short. This is what I want to emphasize. You have done great things, but God says complete the task. When things are coming up short, because if you be willing and obedient, you will eat the good of the land. If you be willing and obedient, I will not withhold any good thing from you. No, yeah, you're walking in some blessing. Don't fall for the acceptable stuff too. Don't say that I got the car. The car is not the dream. The house is not the dream. There's much more that you are anticipating. And when you find yourself coming up short, it is incumbent upon us to start re-examining things and see why is it that these things, these things are coming up short in my life. And the enemy don't want us to look there. He said, grace said you get it all. Well, grace says you get it all if you're obedient to God. Grace says, I guarantee you that it can happen once you follow the instruction. We got to see it in totality. Now, now, now watch this. Watch this. I want to, I want to, I want to emphasize something. So if the text says that here, I got to go, I, I got to be quick here. If the text says that, that he didn't uh, notice what it says in the 31st verse, it says he departed not from the sins of Jeroboam, which made Israel to sin. So if the text says he didn't depart from the sins of Jeroboam who made Israel to sin, I must go out and check out what the sin of Jeroboam was. Because this is very important that we see this in the season. We got to see this. He was cut short because he didn't fully he did some good things, no doubt. The scripture says he did good things, but he didn't fully we've got to obey God to the fullness. What God has planned in us we've got to see it and we got to obey it to the fullness. Well, let's go back and see what the sin of Jeroboam was because it said God cut him short because of the sin of Jeroboam. Let's go back and see what it is. Let's go to 1 Kings the 12th chapter. 1228. I'm going to show you something here. 1228 and I'm going to be done with you. 
12, 28 says it right here. It says, whereupon the king took counsel. This is Jeroboam. It's speaking of Jeroboam right now. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold the gods of Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Now, stick a, stick a pin there. Let me go and show you what God said to him in specifics. Because there was something that God told him. Uh, second, uh, uh, First Kings 11, let's read at the 30th verse. Now, here's the prophet that grabs uh, Jeroboam and tears his clothes. And notice what the prophet said to him. Uh, the 30th, read this on your own time. I'm, I'm paraphrasing because of time's sake. Watch what it says here. 30th verse says, And Hijah caught the new garment that was on him. 29th verse. Let me give the context. It says, And it came to pass at the time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, Ahijah the, the shallow knight, found him in the way, and he had clad himself with a new garment. And they too were alone in the field. And Ahijah, 30th verse, And Ahijah caught the new garment that was on him and ran it into 12 pieces. 31st verse says, and he said to Jeroboam, take thee ten pieces, for thus saith the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will rend the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give ten tribes to thee. 32nd verse, but he shall have one tribe for my servant David's sake and one and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. That's what God tells uh, Jeroboam, who's the son of Solomon's servant. Not in line to be a king, but he said, if you be obedient, even though you're not in the line to be a king, I will make you a king if you obey what I say. Now, let's go back to the 12th chapter of 1 Kings 28. And now let me give emphasis. Now, Jeroboam is now the king. Wherefore, the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. Please hear this. Made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold our gods, O Israel, that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel and the other in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one even in, in Dan. Now here it is. Uh, at Second Kings 10, it says that Jehu did good things, but he didn't follow the instruction completely. And he didn't flee from the sin of Jeroboam. What is the sin of Jeroboam? God had ordained Jeroboam the king of Israel. And he told him, here's the emphasis. Here's the instruction. Here's the specifics on what I want you to do. I'm going to give you 10 tribes, but the other two I'm saving. One for David and one for Jerusalem. Because I have deemed Jerusalem my place of worship. I want the people when they go to worship, go to Jerusalem. Here's the problem. Jeroboam now is a king making an executive decision and say it's too far to go to Jerusalem. Let's make a idol or let's make two places of worship that is more convenient for you. I'll make one in Bethel and one in Dan. You don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem. Now, this is not him telling them they need to worship an idol. This is them him telling them that you're going to worship the God, God of, of Israel. But here's the problem. When God gives us specific instructions and say that I want you to do it like this, when I start altering what God has said, he start cutting me short. And so Jehu uh, uh, did not turn from the sin of Jeroboam. Here's the problem. Jeroboam didn't make them worship an out of God. He worshiped God. But, oh, this is, please hear this. Please, please. Please, please hear this. He didn't tell them to worship a false god. He instructed them to do false worship to a true god. Let me emphasize. What is false worship to a true god? If he says go to Jerusalem, that's where he want to meet you at. If you don't go there, you can say I'm going to do God here. He says you're not worshiping a false god. You're doing false worship to a true god. And now the trouble comes because I'm very specific about what I want you to do. Now, here's the enemy. For convenience sake, he'll tell you it's too difficult for you to do what God instructed you to do. So I wouldn't worry about going there at this time. I wouldn't worry about making those. But the moment I start doing that, now I'm out of the will of God. And if I'm out of the will of God, do you think he continued to give me everything when I'm out of his will? Well, he can't. I'm going to tell you why he can't. Because if he's already instructed you in his word, he makes emphasis all through scripture. I am not a man 
that I should lie. Numbers 23, 19. Neither the son of man that I should repent. I already know what I said and I said it and you don't want me to change because anytime I change my word for you, then you have the ability to question the next time if I'm really going to stand on what I said. So even though you might desire for me to change, I will never change. As a matter of fact, heaven and earth shall pass away. But what I've said, I'm not changing because you don't need me to change. I want you to always depend whether you like it or not that what I said, I mean it and you can stand on it. His word, he holds above everything else. When he says a thing, he does not change. Now that's throughout the Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New Testament, New Covenant. One thing that hasn't changed between covenants is the Word of God. Amen, amen, and amen. So here it is. We have to follow the instruction of God to the T. Right now, he's knocking at the door and saying, I need you to follow what I said because I desire you to walk in the fullness of the blessings of God. Now, for those of you right now, you know, saying, uh, what is going on? And sometimes it's very easy to get caught up into the flow of traffic. In the, in the, in our secular life, everything is dominated by the majority. The majority rules in our second life through our uh, democratic system. If enough people are doing enough things, then it influences society to follow the trend. But in God, it's totally different. In your sacred life, it's totally different. God has send you against every trend. This is why he's so urgently knocking at the door and saying, I don't care how many people are doing whatever they are doing. You better hear ye the word of the Lord and follow that. Because if I am for you, I am more than the world against you. But if I am against you, I am more than the world for you. And that's the thing that we got to understand. That's why there's a complete shifting right now in the spirit realm. And I want to speak this into the hearts and the minds of those of you that are new on the scene. I'll tell you something about God. God never does, what, uh, God, God doesn't uh, implement his plan based off Kairos time. What is Kairos time? It's seconds, minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years. That's called Kairos. God always deals with what is it, 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 uh, Chronos. That's what's called Chronos time. Seconds, minutes, hours, days, year. That's Chronos. God deals with Kairos, meaning the most opportune time. Now, the Bible says this in, 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 in Zechariah 4, 6, real quick. That is not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, said the Lord. Now, we're dealing with a God that is eternal, right? So he doesn't deal with time. Because he's eternal. Time is an offspring of eternity. So God in his spirit can take his spirit and put it on somebody that don't have a lot of chronos in time. Meaning I don't have a lot of experience. But when I put my spirit on you and I'm eternal, I can make you what I need you to be because it's the most opportune time. It's not based off your uh, experience and your seniority and how much uh, power and might you have. It's based off my spirit that I place on someone that might not have experience in the flesh. Y'all follow me now. So if God is eternal, he is the God that was, that is, and is to come. When his spirit hits a man that thou have experienced in the flesh, he become experienced because it's not by power, not by might, but it's by the spirit of God. And I need to speak this into somebody that feels inferior to somebody else because you don't have a lot of experience in the flesh. And people will dominate you because they say, I've been doing it much longer than you've been doing it. And so they want you to feel inferior. So it's, the, it's, a, it's a thing called, just like we got acceptable substitution, there's a thing called time entitlement. People think they're entitled to be heard because they've been around a long time. People think that their instructions are entitled to be followed because they've been around a long time. But when God brings a man in in the most opportune time, he might not have had you in the system where you were corrupted. He put his spirit on you. He says, not by power, not by might, but it's by my spirit. I will instruct you on the directions you should go. And I use anybody I want to use and you will be called the set man. They might not give you a title of anything, but the next title that is going to be dominant in the season called the set man. The set man. So now we're going to lose the title war. We're going to be Reverend Deacon Dr. This, uh, uh, Chief Apostle This, Dr. This, uh, Chief uh, uh, Prophet, but it's going to be called the set man. And when God sets you up, he qualifies you through his spirit, not by power, not by might.
but by my spirit, said the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for the instruction. Thank you for the hearers of your word. I thank you for the move that you are bringing up on this earth to retake the earth and you're using people that in the system is not qualified, but by your spirit, you are giving them the experience and they're going to speak out of their mouth the word of the Lord and the Holy Spirit is going to move upon what they said and there's a change that's happening right now and I thank you right now for your word having preeminence and dominance right now in this season bless the hearers that accept this word and place it and allow it to go deep into their heart thank you for the move that you're moving through them thank you for the power that you're giving them to live this thing Thank you. Give your name, praise, honor, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Now listen to me. Listen to me. This is your season. This is your time. God has given you instruction. Follow the instruction. Watch how incredible life get at the obedience to God's word. Personal relationship is the emphasized word. Be personal with God so that he can speak some things to you. He's going to speak. He's going to set you up because you were pre, you were ordained for such a time as this. You will be the set man and the woman for this season if you hear the voice of the Lord. I am so thankful for today's word and for today's uplift. If you will, do me a favor. Go share this with 20 people. This word has got to invade. This word has got to invade. This, there's a shifting in the spirit. I wish I could go really deep into that. There's a shifting right now. There's a shifting. There's a shifting, and you are, are a part of the shift. Don't let anybody tell you that God can't use you. It's not by power, not by might, but by my spirit, say it, the Lord. So prepare yourself, prepare yourself, prepare yourself. I would right now prepare your, I would be preparing for the life that I'm about to live. Prepare for the promotions in God. Make the decision. It's going to be tough. One day. In the courts of the Lord is worth a thousand. It's a tough choice to make, but once I get in, I'm going to say, what took me so long to make this choice or this decision to be in the position of God? I love all y'all. Thank y'all for being in the house. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Andrea. Ambassador for Network of Believers. Thank you. Thank God for uh, 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 giving you to us, Andrea. Thank God so much. Thank you, Leo, from uh, uh, San Francisco. Looking forward to seeing you this weekend. Thank you, Chosen Alan Tate. Uh, Deidre, Pastor Deidre, thank you so much. Of course, my wife, thank you for ever support. Thank you, thank you. Raina, thank you, thank you, thank you. Jeanette Wallace, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Glenda Treadwell, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, Anitra, thank you. Internet Iverson, thank you guys so much. I always acknowledge people. Why? Because people are special to God, and I always want to acknowledge you. Thank you so much. Thank you for, for watching uh, Pastor Deborah Taylor. Thank you so much. I think she's in New York. Thank you, Anthony Stokes, for being in the house. Elaine Kendrick, thank you. Uh, uh, Chris Brown, what's up, man? My friend, thank you so much. Marissa, thank you so much. Uh, Sh uh, Shasta... T Tammy, thank you so much. I hope I didn't miss it. Terry, what's up? Being Dallas Wednesday, man. Uh, Arthur Divine, my brother. Thank you so much, Pastor Arthur Divine. Thank you so much. Tony Dedrick, thank you guys so much. Uh, Donna Randall, thank you so much. In Los Angeles, uh, Uplift Assembly member, thank you so much. Thank you, Christine. Thank you so much for being in the house. Pastor Christine, thank you so much. Uh, BJ, thank you so much for being in the house. Who else is in it? Thank you, Pastor B, Belinda, my youth pastor at Network. Thank you, Paula Smith. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. My sister Gloria in the house. Thank you, Pastor Gilbert. Thank you, Gilbert Jones. Thank you so much. All right, guys, that's as much as my phone will let me go back. I, I Have a blessed day. Tomorrow night, 6.30 p.m. at 11, 11 West 7th Street, Bible study. Hey, look, if you don't know, ask somebody. We got a question and answer session. You can be there tomorrow. We'll do that tomorrow. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thanks so much. All right. I am Marlo. Thank you, Marlo. Renee, thank you so much. Thank you guys for being in the house. My friend, Apostle John Harris. What is up, my brother? We need to talk real soon. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for being in the house. Thank you, Apostle Anthony Bradford in Denver. Thank you so much for being in the house. All the other pastors that 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 came inside. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for so much for being in there. Yes, sir, Apostle John Harris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, man. Atlanta. 
Yes, sir. Sheila Austin, thank you for being out. I've got to get out of here. I love you guys. I would love spending more time. But I'll see you guys tomorrow night, 1111 West 7th Street. Go back and listen to this again. And if you know somebody that's struggling right now with their walk, uh, present this to them. Say, look at this. Look at this. Uh, show them the advantages that God has already placed in place and what the instructions are. Instructions are everything, man. If you can't follow the instructions, you can have some things to your advantage. If you don't know the revelation that God, if you, have, you don't know the word, mm, 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 it, is, it is difficult. You'll live life and never take advantage of all the things that God has made you privy to. So now let's get into the instructions of God and let's condition ourselves. Remember, decisions decide seasons. And, and ultimately, your decision you make will affect every choice from that day forward. So make the right decision right now. And that's all in God. I'm hearing so much stuff that gets on my nerves. Uh, we are going to the acceptable substitution. What are we doing? What are we doing? I heard somebody say the other day that there's going to be power and there's not going to be just Holy Ghost power. I'm like, really? Are we gone there that we have... Uh, gotten to the place that the power and the spirit of God is not enough. I know we, I know we, we, we're not seeing the results of it because we're not fully uh, applying what God is giving. We are semi. We got too many uh, uh, alternatives. If you, if, if if the Bible starts off by saying that there was chaos on this earth, darkness, void. If the Bible says that the spirit of the Lord moved up on this earth and God said, let there be light. If the spirit of the Lord can move up on this earth and change the chaos and the darkness and the voidness, why can't it do it now? That's why the enemy don't want us to get there. But we are getting there when we're trusting God. It's going to change everything. Holla, I'm out of here. I'll start preaching again. Thank you. See you guys later. Thank you. Holla. Thank you, Sheila Austin. Thank you, Melba Baker. Holla, I'm out of here. Pastor